Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast sharing how to create and grow income streams and manage, multiply, and protect your wealth in the new economy. Are you tired of trading your time for money? Do you desire freedom today instead of retirement in 10, 20, or 30 years? I'm MC Lobsher, and this is the Cashflow Ninja. Hello, Cashflow Ninjas. MC Lobsher here, and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have a great show for you today. In today's show, we're going to look at how to pick a market for your real estate investments. My guest in this episode is Anna Myers. Anna is the Vice President of Grow Capitus Investments, a firm dedicated to finding and presenting rock-solid commercial real estate investments to its capital partners. The team at Grow Capitus is on a mission to help investors become financially free by putting their money in apartment buildings, student and senior housing in choice markets across the country. Grow Capitus also runs an educational platform known as Multifamily U that offers online and in-person training around multifamily investment and current trends in real estate. If you're interested in joining our investors group, you could go to cashflowninja.com forward slash investors group and fill out an application form and or email me at info at to start the discussion to see if you're a good fit for our group. And if you're living in the Philadelphia, Bucks County and Southern New Jersey area, we are hosting a live investors meetup event every month in Newtown, Pennsylvania. For more information on the monthly event and information on how to join us at our next live event, you could go to cashflowninja.com forward slash events. I'm also speaking at the Multifamily Investor Nation Summit coming up on June 27th through June 29th. It's a three-day information-packed event for multifamily investors with over a 1,000 attendees and over 50 speakers. You'll hear from experts about finding deals, raising capital, underwriting strategies, selecting markets, and much, much more. To access the event, you could go to apartmentevent.com to grab your ticket and use promo code NINJA to get $100 off. If you are like many of the listeners of the show, you're always looking for unique ways to protect and grow your hard-earned capital. But sometimes, that's easier said than done. The key to investing late in the cycle is identifying favorable opportunities on a risk-adjusted basis. That's where our friends at ASIM Capital come in. Since 2011, ASIM has helped more than 300 accredited investors allocate more than $20 million dollars to mobile home parks, self-storage, and workforce housing due to the ability to generate asymmetric returns while protecting their investors' portfolios. If you're interested in learning more, head over to asymcapital.com. That's A-S-Y-M capital.com to get instant access to their investment offerings. MC Lobshire, the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast and also the president and chief wealth and investment strategist of Producers Wealth, where we help our clients integrate cashflow banking, also known as infinite banking, with their business and investments. If you're interested in learning more about how we create strategies that integrate cash flow banking and investments to turbocharge them, you can access a video series at yourownbankingsystem.com. That's your own banking system.com. Anna, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Great to be here with you. Yeah, appreciate connecting and having you on. Um, can you share a little bit about your background and journey with my listeners? Sure. Well, um, my real estate journey actually began before I was born because my grandfather is what I consider to be a real estate maverick in Southern California. So he uh, originally was in Tampa, Florida, you know, doing some real estate over there. And he saw it on the West Coast, things were really happening. So he sold everything he had in Tampa, went to Southern California, LA, and started flipping houses. And people think like, wow, flipping houses. But yeah, they used to flip houses way back then. And then he uh, became a self-made millionaire at a time when that really meant something and uh, build up this, this kind of real estate empire um, and then, you know, was buying orange groves and walnut groves and converting them into shopping malls. And he was one of the guys in the history books that actually realized at the time that invest that when you build something near an exit, a freeway exit, that was a key thing. And back then it was, it may not be quite as key now. Um, but again, he was very entrepreneurial, very um, a forward thinker. And so that was kind of the fabric that I grew up with was um, a strong example of commercial real estate being the wealth in my family, as well as somebody who just was not afraid to strike out and be different 
and build things. Uh, my dad's an architect. Um, I was always, cons uh, all of my, me as well as all my brothers and sisters were always encouraged to be entrepreneurial. Um, so what did I do? I actually, um, instead of real estate, I got involved as a programmer. So I became, a, a, I went into the information technology world. And why did I do that? Well, I, I, am, I am a problem solver. I, I love to solve problems. I've also got a, a, an artistic side to me, which I was always like, art, science, art, science, which do I want to do? But I ended up having a baby very young. And so that changed my world. And I was a single parent. I was a teenager. And I needed to provide income as well as pursued, proceed in my education. So I became a programmer so I could do that. Fast forward, I did a great, uh, had a great career in IT. And that as my background is a, you know, a data, land, data analyst as well as a systems architect. And then I, uh, I bid a big pivot and pivoted into photography. So I actually, the, the IT industry crashed in the year 2000. And I had always wanted to be a photographer. Again, that art science thing, right? And mm -hmm. so I said, you know, I'm going to go into uh, this photography and have a career here. What I learned, uh, first of all, is when you're really good at something, um, and you make good money at it, the government wants to take most of that money, especially when you're a, uh, you know, an entrepreneur and you're working for yourself. And um, so that was a big problem for me because I just felt like I was working for, the, for to, to pay taxes. That's all my money was going to taxes. And so in solving that problem, I was like, well, how am I going to do this? I, I, I can't stop working. So I went back to real estate and I started investing as a real estate investor to protect my income as a, um, as a, as a business. And, um, and it worked, of course it works. We know it works, right? It's a great way to, to shelter. And, and because of all the advantages that real estate investors have, you can really leverage a lot of that to protect them, the cash flow that you have from businesses. But what I continued down that path, I realized that the, the, the career that I had created for myself, even though I love photography, was completely non-scalable. And real estate is extremely scalable. And so I pivoted again, and I pivoted, and I did made a, a, a plan that, um, in fi a five-year plan that I was going to go um, from my photography career at a 1,500 square foot studio, a uh, very successful photographer in the Bay Area, to full-time uh, real estate. And that is what I was able to successfully do. I now am a full-time commercial real estate. I went big time into multifamily, Again, I'm all about scalability. I re retraded back to my IT days because I've never lost that as a programmer. I, um, I love applying data science methodology to real estate. And that's, uh, so I bring all of my various skill sets into what I do now. And that is, um, along with my partner, Neil Bawa, we uh, source deals from all over the nation from the best markets and the best neighborhoods and find um, great uh, product for our investors, applying data science to determine what is gonna deliver the best results. Now markets is constantly changing and there's massive changes going on right now um, all over the US, um, mass migration from one area to another area. Absolutely. Uh, there's demographic trends playing into this. Um, what are some of the things that you can share with our listeners just around that, if you want to comment on that, and also, um, how, how do you identify these, some of these markets? How do you pick a market to go into, uh, especially for a lot of newbies? A lot of newbies might be listening as, as an active or as a passive investor. Yeah, and that's, that's really uh, good that you pointed out because we, you know, we are active investors. And, and uh, by the way, we do teach a boot camp for other people that want to learn how to be active investors. So our mindset is really all about teaching people to be active and also teaching passive investors how to vet deals. Because whether you're active or passive, you should understand markets. So when you're looking at a deal, you can decide, is this a market that's going somewhere? Is this a good place to place my money? And so some of the um, key things that we look at are two of the things you mentioned was population trends. Um, as, and then coupled with job trends, those are, are, are definitely huge uh, movers for markets. And uh, we're looking at workforce housing and above. So we, we do, you know, class B as well as class C. Um, we also do new construction, which, which could be considered class A. But for population trends, um, we're looking to make sure that there is a significant amount of uh, population that has moved into that market 
we look back to the year 2000 through current, as current as you can get, depending on the data source that you have. And we're looking for a significant amount of population movement into that market between that time. Now, the smaller the market, you know, the ratios are going to depend on whether it's a, you know, a, a 500,000 people or over a million. So we look at those um, in different ways. But we're looking for the bigger the market, if it's an 18% increase, 25% increase, those are big numbers. But those are going to be on the smaller markets. When you look at a very large market, you might see, um, you know, 4% increase. And, you, and when you really do the numbers, you go, that's a big un- increase for a market that's, that's several million people to have a 4% increase is substantial. Um, so population coming into a market, we do not invest in markets where population is leaving. And um, a lot of people will, look, if you look at the markets that you're interested in, look Google, if you Google uh, the name of the city plus population, it's gonna bring up a little um, table and it's got a slider on it. And you can slide back to the year 2000 and see what the population was. So, you know, Google population, Phoenix, Arizona, and then you'll see this little, this little table and you can see what it was in 2000 and what it is um, closer to now. Often it's 2016, 2019. It depends on their source of data that they have. And you can really see who's growing and who's shrinking. So very important to see where is the population moving to. Then we're also, of course, looking at jobs. Where are the jobs going to? It's not surprising that jobs often move with population because the jobs want to go where the population's going. But sometimes the jobs are the leader because they're leaving places that are less affordable. Um, And so they need to move to places where they can um, have workers that can afford to buy a house or afford to have a decent lifestyle. So jobs are another major, major marker for us, your tenants need to be able to pay their rent. And they can only pay their rent if there's a diversity of jobs represented in the market. So if different, you know, if a recession does hit or certain sectors get hit with the recessions, you want to have a very diversified marketplace so that you have a variety of jobs that your tenants can be employed at and you get less hit um, as, a, as, a, as an apartment owner by your tenants not being able to pay their rent. So the diversification of the job markets too, just that's a a fantastic point because there might be something springing up, but it's one or two industries. Exactly. One or two industries leaving out of an area can completely decimate it as we saw with the Rust Belt. Yes, Uh, absolutely. With areas that are very focused on autos. Um, You know, there's some areas that as a a market demographer, as I'm looking at the market, I see certain sectors, certain cities really taking off. And then I always have to look and say, well, what is it? Is it the price of oil that's driving it? Is it um, a military town that suddenly the budgets have really increased? Um, So you always want to understand what is, why is there a sudden change? And is that a good thing? What happens if that trend reverses Um, and you're in for a five or six or a 10 year hold, how will that impact you? So um, understanding that it, you know, we, we love to see, People, you know, different markets coming, like Amazon coming in. You can follow certain people to say, well, there's a lot going on there. But I'll give you um, Jacksonville as an example. We recently invested in Jacksonville. And my impression of Jacksonville, you know, not knowing, I hadn't invested there yet. I was thinking, oh, you know, lots of military in Jacksonville. But when I really, you know, as I was doing my due diligence and I looked at the employment, I was so impressed. I mean, it is like a pie with every shade of the rainbow and, you know, lots of pieces, lots of, you know, good sized chunky pieces of pie. That's a good market. That's a market where you're like, yeah, there is a true diversification in a market like Jacksonville. Um, and that kind of plays into the demographic trend, too, right? Yes. From a lot of people moving into into Florida just to so it hits the jobs, the diversification of the market and the jobs mm-hmm. there. Um, the industries, obviously there's growing industries. One that I just noted here down is healthcare is obviously a, a very big, huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah well, huge. And not only, I mean, it's everywhere. Right. But that's like something people are always going to need in every mm-hmm. market. So I really like seeing healthcare as a chunky section in, in any market that we're in. Uh, we also recently acquired a, a property, uh, in Tucson, Arizona, um, I love that market. Tucson's an amazing market. It's really on the on the up and come. In fact, it was just rated uh, the top market for rent growth for small markets. And uh, when we first invested uh, a, a, maybe a quarter ago, 
And we Mm -hmm. were doing our due diligence. It was like number two or number three on the list. And now it's number one. So, um, it, you know, that type of studying of data and analyzing and, you know, the, the, the market studies that we did, they don't lie when you're looking at that stuff and you're like, yeah, Tucson is a solid market to invest in and the trends are going there. You know, it, right. it starts to show, you know, that it was a, a great place. But healthcare is a big player in the Tucson market. For sure. Yeah. And then uh, so wh- one of the things that we've, me- that we've mentioned before, there's there's a website, How Money Walks. Great, great website. But so you, you figure out and you had mentioned that the, from a personal pain, the problems that you had was taxes. Yes. So they follow, you know, let's just let's just throw it out there. California, Illinois, New York, New Jersey. I mean, it's the, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's the uh, it's the states that keep coming back up and up when you when you bring when you have the tax discussion. Right. Absolutely. You know, well, I'm born and raised in California and, and live there still. So, yes, I've, I've been a person that's been very heavily, heavily taxed, um, but a person that takes advantage of real estate to, um, you know, leverage real estate to, to prevent over taxation as much as possible. Yeah. So where, then the to your point um, about looking at markets, too. So where are these folks going? You know, that's uh-huh. and that's what that and that's, I think, um, the data that that folks, people are then looking for. So Arizona that you just touched Arizona. on. Arizona. I'll is tell you another that, market that we really like that I believe a lot of uh, companies as well as Californians are going to is Utah is obviously a state, not a market. But there's mm-hmm. multiple multiple markets in Utah that we love. So yep. you know, we love Salt Lake City. We love Provo. Uh, mm-hmm. We're big fans of St. George, but that's just a secret between me and you. Don't tell anybody about St. George, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I'm, I'll make sure. I'll make sure not you to. You got to take this out. Don't don't include that in, 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 in the interview, please. Um, we also uh, no surprise for anyone that's listened to to Neil Bawa and his uh, amazing annual um, webinar that he does about real estate markets, and uh, he does a shoot a shoot down between different markets. And he always um, pegs a market that is his, his, you know, what he thinks is going to be the best market, Boise, Idaho, two years in a row. Oh, wow. So that is another amazing market. Um, now, you know, these are hard markets to get into because the cap rates are lower in, in Utah. Um, they're lower in Boise. So you just, you really have to go after it. Um, but I'll tell you one of the strategies we're using. I mean, we're, we're value add um, multifamily people. But when the cap rates get so low that it doesn't make sense to buy value add, what do you do? What do mm-hmm. we do? We build. So we're yeah. actually looking at, at building. We're looking at new construction in some of those markets. And you know, our, our current portfolio is about 150 million, uh, and about 60 million of that is new construction. So it it isn't um, something that's completely unfamiliar to us. It's something. It's a a, a tool in our toolkit that we can pull out. And for key markets where the cap rates don't make sense for value add, we are we are engaging in um, new construction um, as a as an option. Right, and then obviously Flor- Florida is uh, is definitely on the radar where a lot of folks are going to in Texas, right? Yeah, I believe I didn't say Texas. Texas is also also a big one. So once you nail down a couple of states uh, that you're interested in and make sense for you um, and is within your comfort. Um, the market that you're picking, obviously major and then sub, what type of neighborhoods, once you're in a city in particular market, what are some of the uh, the things that you look for in a neighborhood to try and figure out what would be the best neighborhood to invest in? Sure. Well, one key factor we're looking for is median household income and also the, the price of the houses and the rents. So, we don't want to invest in the most expensive neighborhood in the market because mm-hmm. you're not going to make any money there. So we're looking for cash flow. Okay. So, you know, you're going to end up with a nice house, but you're going to not, not going to be able to make any cash flow off of it. So we're looking for that sweet spot where the rents are, you know, maybe between 800 to 1100. Once you get above that, you're going to, your returns are, are going to be much less. Um, now, why do we have a lower, and I'm talking about an average rent across an apartment building because you might have you know, studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, et cetera. Um, and we might make an exception to go lower than 800 in some markets. But we do have that lower threshold in general because if you are in a, in a place where your average rent is 600, 
we have found that with uh, tenants who the average rent is 600, that you may not get paid your rent 12 months out of the year. Um, so that you, you know, you want a high enough um, level of rent expectation that your tenant base will be paying you consistently. And once you go too low, you're, you know, we've just found that you're going to have an increase in, in bad debt and um, delinquency and a lot more turn. And that's going to affect your profits because you're going to just have so much more eviction and, and have to deal with that. So we're looking at the, the um, rents, the median household income that we like is, is very similar, similar reason is 40,000 and above. So, uh, you know, 39, if it's like that now, you, if it's too high, then you get into that other range where it's like, I don't know if we're going to make money in this market. It's, it's too, it's too, too expensive of a market. We're not going to make um, a good gross rental yield here. Um, so median, and then we also look at crime. Renters don't want to live where there's extreme high crime, right? Um, mm -hmm. Crime is more expensive than schools for apartment renters, interestingly enough. I mean, not that they don't care about schools, but if, yeah. if it's one or the other, then crime is, a, is more weighing on someone's mind than a school because they're not moving into an apartment. Like when you buy someplace, you're buying it and you're like, oh, my kid's going to be here for 10 years. You're living in an apartment for, for 18 months or something, right? You can, yeah. school is not as important. But for crime, what we want to see is we want to see the crime rates going down, okay? So again, we look at the historic trend. We don't like to invest places. that If you look on city data and you scroll down maybe two-thirds of the page, there's a crime table. So I'm going to refer to the numbers they have in there. City data is a free source, so we always encourage people to look at free versus – we use a lot of paid sources, but you know, just not to add – add money onto people's monthly budget. Um, so in the crime area, we're looking for that last box on the right to be lower than 500. So, you, you know, we, we don't like investing in places that are higher than 500. Um, mm -hmm. And then you want to look all the way to the left, which is like your 2000 and then you're going forward. Um, you want to see the crime rate going down. So say the crime rate was 400. You don't want the crime rate all the way to the left to be 200 right? Because now you're showing an increase in crime in the area. Um, right. and we, do, we do dig in and see, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to, when you're in a C-class neighborhood, you will have crime. So you're not going to find C areas to invest where there's no crime. It's, it's just, that's just not the way city, cities work. The more densely urban it is, the, the more crime you're going to have. So you've got to have to dig into that a little bit. Um, we, of course, are also looking at unemployment, so when we're looking at unemployment, that's a very important feature for a micro neighborhood. How many people are working in this neighborhood, yeah. right? Um, so what we like to say in terms of a metric is if you look at the, um, the unemployment rate for the city, okay? So you look, Google it, what's the unemployment rate for Phoenix? And then with that micro neighborhood, you don't want the micro neighborhood to exceed 2% over the, the city's unemployment. OK, now, you, the, if it does, if you're finding high unemployment, you again, you have to dig into it because you look at what that neighborhood is made up of. So if the neighborhood has a lot of students, mm -hmm. that could throw off your trends. If the neighborhood has a lot of retirees, that could throw off your trend. So you you do need to consider that, you know, that when you're looking at unemployment, understanding what is driving that. You're listening to The Cashflow Ninja, the show helping people all over the world create monthly cash flow and achieve freedom today, not in 10, 20, 30, and or 40 years. This is a show where cash is not king, but cash flow is king. We will be right back after a word from our sponsors. My friend Dave Zook says, you can be conventional or you can be wealthy. Pick one. Dave and his team at The Real Asset Investor have syndicated many successful real estate and ATM projects over the last decade. Now his team has an exclusive opportunity for investors in the coal space. Do you want to be part of an energy project that takes conventional coal and cleans it up by extracting liquids while releasing almost zero emissions? The sale of these liquids can produce strong double-digit cash flow and aggressive tax benefits against ordinary income 
all while using America's number one most plentiful resource in a responsible, efficient manner. Now that's non-conventional. For more information on this exclusive opportunity, you can visit therealassetinvestor.com or contact the Real Asset Investor team at info at therealassetinvestor.com. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the United States. Our simple proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Learn how to find the best deals by downloading your free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Passive Real Estate Investing at noradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. You're listening to The Cashflow Ninja, the show helping people all over the world create monthly cash flow and achieve freedom today, not in 10, 20, 30, and or 40 years. This is the show where cash is not king, but cash flow is king. Now let's return to our interview. Could you share a little bit more about your process because you guys are ninjas applying the data science to find best deals in markets and neighborhoods and drilling down in micro uh, uh, neighborhoods. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on your process? Um, uh, sure. Well, um, we have our free sources, but what do I use personally? Um, I use, um, when I'm first looking at a property, I use a um, paid service called Neighborhood Scout. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let me let me step back. The first thing I use is local market monitor. Okay, so I'm going to look at the big market, and when mm -hmm. I um, so I'm going to pull up the market and local market monitor, and uh, that is going to give me a report that is going to be looking at the job trends, the population trends. It's also looking at the valuation of the um, real estate. It's focused on on single family, and many of these paid sources are focused on single family. So you, you just have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, it gives us the ability to do some forecasting on rents in there. Um, so it's my, one of my key pieces is looking at local market monitor to understand a snapshot of the market. Markets change, and these, these, um, these reports on local market monitor get updated, um, I'd say probably every two months. It could be every month, depend, you know, depending mm -hmm. on the market. And so that's a, a really great resource for us. Um, and then once I understand the local, the, the overall market, I zero in with Neighborhood Scout, which is neighborhoodscout.com, mm -hmm. and pull the report to understand um, what's going on in the micro neighborhood. And the Neighborhood Scout report is just this abundance of information. And I love it because it's very graphical. Because right? remember, I'm like the art science person, right? And so mm -hmm. I really love the way they've laid out their stuff. And uh, so the first thing I look at when I pull my Neighborhood Scout report is I look at the trend forecast for Neighborhood Scout. And they, they have like, it's a one to five. And there's two things they're looking at. They're looking at the, um, the one is the blue chip, like what's, it, what's the appreciation value going forward? And one is the path of what is the likelihood that it's going to ex, uh, exceed right now? So it's kind of like path of progress. Like, are you in the path of progress? And are you a blue chip? Like historically, how is this area done? Um, so one to five, you know, we're looking at how well it's doing there. Um, it's not common that you're going to get four fives or five fives. More often, you're going to see three twos, two threes, like that type of thing. Um, I dig into the demographics quite a bit in that report. I'm going to look at the median household income again. I'm going to look at that. It's going to tell you all about who lives there. So it yeah. breaks down all the different people that are there. What are the ages? What are the employments? Um, what are the, the makeups of the households? So it gives me a great view. So if my unemployment is high, I can, in that report, I can say, well, like, oh, well, I see why it's high. Uh, it's because there's a lot of students here. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's very obvious within that. So that is definitely one of my favorite, my favorite tools um, to combine with. And then it also does some market demographics there as well. Great. I want to touch on opportunity zones a little bit because I know that this is something that uh, you're very w uh, well versed in as well. For listeners not familiar with it, uh, can you just briefly explain what it is? Sure. So um, opportunity zones were introduced in um, 2017 when the new tax law was passed. Mm -hmm. And um, what they did is they defined over 8,700 areas in the United States. These are specific census tracts 
Mm -hmm. um, so each state has them. That's the governors that were responsible for defining them. Um, and what they are is this, if you are to invest in these areas in very specific ways, there are three benefits that you can get. Now, first of all, you need to be bringing in a capital gain. So say, let's imagine that you um, sold a bunch of stock and you have a million dollars gain. Okay, good for you. But you don't want to pay taxes on all that gain. So what can you do with it? Well, now you can move it into an opportunity zone um, project. So if you move it in, you have three benefits. One is that you're going to defer paying your capital gains on that, that uh, sale that you, that transaction for mm -hmm. seven years. So not until 2027 do you need to pay your capital gains taxes. The other element is if you were able to get it in by December 31st of 2019, you will have a reduced basis in what you need to pay. So you'll have a step down to 85% of the tax of, of the gain that you'll need to be taxed on versus 100%. Okay, what happens if you get it in after December 31st of 2019? Then you are at a 10% versus 15%, and that stays there for two years. Eventually, you lose the basis. So, at, but hey, at least you've got a seven years that you're not having to pay. You're deferred for seven years, right? Mm -hmm. That's a huge advantage. That money that you bring in, that million dollars that you brought in, and you invested in an asset the gain on that asset, you have to hold, the, has, the asset has to be held for 10 years, all right? Otherwise you don't get this gain. This is, the, the thing is that the gain that you get on that asset is federal, from a federal perspective, is tax free. No taxes do you have to pay on that, and that's forever. It's not like a 1031 where it's like, well, it's tax free, but only if you now move it into something else. No, nope, right. tax free, you win, so. Um, now, the states have not yet, interestingly enough, the states are just trying to catch up on, like, how are they going to um, tax this? And some, I think different states will have different answers. So that's mm -hmm. something. But, you know, honestly, the federal part is always the biggest part of taxation, right? Yeah. So, it, um, so we see it as a huge advantage. We, we have a lot of investors that are either selling houses. You can, you can, you can it's, it's an option. It's an alternative option for a 1031, which many people find difficult to do. So instead, you can move that money into an opportunity zone fund. Um, uh, you can, you can for a sale of a car, sale of artwork, sale of stocks. So many, many types of gains. What they're trying to do, it, what the government was trying to do is unlock all of this tapped, all of this capital gains that was locked up that people didn't want to sell because they didn't want to pay taxes. Yeah. And is that they're able to move it into these areas and these opportunity zones are um, supposedly distressed areas, right? These are areas that need capital coming in in order to catch them up with the surrounding neighborhoods. So that was, I should have probably said that right from the beginning. Sorry, I missed that part. Um, I get pretty excited talking about opportunity zones. Um, <laughs> So how do we improve those areas? Now, the way that you, that you take on one of those projects, again, there are some very specific things you have to do. It's not like you just buy um, an apartment building and you're like, good, I'm in an opportunity zone. My investors are going to get all of those advantages. That's not true. So there's some things you need to do. The first thing is you need to understand that you need to bring in the same amount of money to invest in uh, improving your, the asset as the value of the building, Okay. So let's use that $1 million again, because it's a nice round number. I like a million dollars. So say you buy a building for a million dollars. The building and the land is a million dollars. The land is worth $300,000 and the building is worth $700,000. Well, now, in order to meet opportunity zone regulations, you need to bring in an additional $700,000 to improve that building to make it eligible to, to, to qualify for these opportunity zone um, uh, you know, regulations. Now, what could you do? What if, what if that land was zoned so you could build another building? That would be a good play, right? So, because yep. it's pretty hard to, to, to improve a building. We talk a lot about value add multifamily, what we call, you know, lipstick on a pig, right? You can't buy enough lipstick for that pig to make it eligible for opportunity zone. So let's just, you know, be clear about that. So what we think is that most opportunity zone plays are really um, new construction to some degree, whether you're building an additional new building in, in the back or you're starting ground up construction from the very beginning, right? Yep. And as I mentioned, we, we have experience in new construction. So this isn't an area that, um, that you know, we're, we're afraid of going into. We are embracing it wholeheartedly. 
At the same time, we have identified specific perils that we believe that investors need to understand um, that, you know, it's not just about, hey, there's a tax free thing. Let me jump in. So what are some of those perils? Well, first of all, remember, we said that this is a depressed area that we're going into and we were talking about new construction. How do those two things work together? What are you building a class A building in a class C or class D area? That is not necessarily going to work. OK, the other thing is that there's a lot about developers. So when you're when you're doing opportunity zones, we're partnering with developers. That developer needs to have, you know, lots of experience, first of all, as a developer. But most developers, what do they do? They their their MO is they build something that, you know, they develop it and then they sell it and they move on and they develop again because that's what they do. They're developers that won't work for opportunity zones. Right. Because remember, for an opportunity zone to be, to be eligible to, to success, successfully get your gain in the end, tax-free, it has to be held for 10 years. And that means the developer has to stay on the project for 10 years. So we look for developers that that's their normal mode of business. They're like, yeah, I'm a developer and I keep what I, I, you know, I hold on to what I build. That's my normal thing and I know how to asset manage. We've got experience in that. That's what we do. So we're very, very selective. So we're taking all of these ways that we apply data science to markets and we're applying additional new ways that we've come up with and we're applying them to opportunity zones, okay? So um, developers obviously very important. Another thing that, that we look at is the zone itself. So there's over 8,700 markets or, or, or census tracts that are, that are part of, that are eligible opportunity zones. Well, 19% of those zones are in already gentrifying areas. So clearly that's where we're going to focus. You know, we're going to, if we're placing investor money, we are focused on placing it in a way, in a place that is going to have a high degree of success of, of that asset um, actually increasing in value. So if we're able to place it in areas that are already gentrifying, that's one step ahead of the game. And we're doing that by looking at median household income and all of these things that we talked about before. Another thing that we look at, which um, most people had, I mean, most people say like that, this just blows my mind. I've never even considered this for opportunity zones. This is again, a Neil Bauerism. So say you, you have an opportunity zone census tract and you know, where do you want to invest in that tract? Where do you, you know, say you're, you know, you're looking at it as a big one. It's, you know, say it's a big tract. Well, we say we don't want to invest in the middle because if you consider like a big pancake, you don't want to put your butter in the middle we want to put it at the edge. Well, why do we want to put it at the edge? Why do we want to invest at the edge? We want to invest at the edge because the edge, all around the opportunity zone are areas of higher median household income, lower cap rates. So by investing at the edge, there's a much greater likelihood that that area is going to be absorbed into the areas around it. It has a much greater chance of success than than be investing in the middle of the opportunity zone and hoping kind of that 80, 20 rule, you know, 20% of them are going to work. 80% of them are just not. So we yep. want to be on the 20. We're always looking to be on the 20 side with everything we do. And um, it comes with a lot of innovative thinking and, you know, out of the box. So as we approach everything, we, Neil and I are both technologists. We're always bringing our, our previous experiences in, as entrepreneurs and business leaders into like we're using other people's money let's be smart about this how do we you know how do we really squeeze the juice out of this concept and make it as best possible for our investors money absolutely one habit i've observed from wealthy and successful people is that they're always studying new subjects and learning new skill sets what are you currently studying what skill sets are you currently learning well, opportunity zones, we, we just covered a lot of that. Yeah. I've been completely in, in, you know, it's a new concept for everybody, right? Because it, the, the laws just came out. I just spent um, last week, I was at an opportunity zone conference for a long time. And because, um, because we're, I'm now underwriting. So I, I am the lead underwriter for the group. Um, again, that, that, you know, that math programming side of me. And I've gotten really good at value add multifamily underwriting. In fact, I teach it in our boot camp. Um, and I teach it on webinars. I do webinars monthly that that provide free access to those types of things. But now I'm doing uh, new construction. Um, so that's kind of a, a new challenge for me is to be underwriting all of this new construction stuff. 
And um, so I'm loving that because it's bringing me back. I'm new, uh, underwriting large commercial, like mixed use areas. And I'm like, this is really resonating with me because it goes back to what my grandfather used to do. So, yeah. uh, you know, here I am like back with the mixed use, big commercial, you know, shopping malls I'm underwriting and, you know, all kinds of, of just cool assets. And I'm like, this is, this is kind of, you know, it's, it's interesting to me. I'm also always, you know, pushing myself on reading. Um, I know you had Matt uh, Faircloth on a while ago. I'm very focused on um, concepts of raising capital. And I, I'm a big fan of Matt as well as uh, Liz Faircloth, wonderful people. And um, I think they, uh, uh, so, you know, focusing on raising capital in ethical ways and smart ways is, is something I'm also spending uh, my time learning. Fantastic. Uh, now, a core message in our show is to leave our families, communities, and the world better than we found it by mm-hmm. passing down a mindset, values, and principles to future generations, not just money. So if you cannot pass on any money to future generations, and we're only allowed to pass on three principles to them to build wealth and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? Um, well, I think the first thing I would that I feel privileged that was passed on to me, and I want to pass on to my future generations, my children and grandchildren, um, is the entrepreneurial mindset. So um, I was very um, privileged that my parents and grandparents were great examples of that, and um, I was able to not be bogged down in early in life with the, with the idea that I had to work a job and you know meet certain standards, and that was all there was to life. So I was encouraged to open my own business and have an S corp and do all that. They're like, yeah, this is a much better way to be. So I want to encourage my future generations to think big as well too. And, and, you know, it's, I, I want to say think big in terms of life, not that they have to have big money. It's about what they're happy with, but um, it's not about just working in a cubicle. Um, it's about having big dreams and, um, and, and the confidence to go after them. And I, I really liked that my family has confidence in all of us that we're, we're able to do it. So that entrepreneurial mindset and also that it's okay to fail, you know, that's part of being an entrepreneur. Not everything you do is going to succeed, but that's where you really learn the most lessons, I think, is by really um, studying why something didn't work and internalizing it and paying attention to it and then uh, making the changes necessary and going after it again. So that's one of them. Um, Another thing um, is I really want to pass on to my children to seek experiences and and not objects in life. So um, life is, you know, a wonderful thing. But if you get caught up in seeking big houses and big cars, um, I'm just a person that would rather seek, you know, long and big adventures. And so I would want to encourage uh, my my children and grandchildren to to pursue big adventures and seek experiences. Um, and I guess lastly, um, I, I don't know, uh, it, it might sound, sound kind of uh, frou-frou, but I, I always try and operate from a position of love. Um, I think it's, it's uh, such a, a, a deep space in, in humanity that if we're always able to, to open ourselves to, it's a, it's a way of opening yourself to the universe and, and what's around you. So if you operate from a place of love, love for your family, love for yourself, love for the community, love for the person that you're facing, just being like, hey, this is a human being. I love humans. Um, that that can put you in a better space instead of being always competitive. Um, it, I believe it puts you in a, a, a space of being very open-minded and, um, and then um, also very ethical. Because if you're operating from a place of love, you're always trying to figure out what the best solution is for everybody in the situation. And, and, that, and I think that's a very important place to be in business. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Anna, where can my listeners learn more about you, uh, your company, and uh, stay informed of all the projects that, they're in, uh, that you're involved in? Sure. So, so um, the syndications that we do for passive investors is growcapitus.com is where you can find us. That's G-R-O-C-A-P-I-T-U-S.com. And then if you want to learn how to become an active investor, then you can go to multifamilyu.com. So that's multifamily and the letter u.com. And that's where we teach people how to buy apartment buildings, how to underwrite, you know, how to do these things. And I would say that there's lots of great content on there, lots of free, great webinar content that even passive investors should check out. Uh, Information about markets, 
how we approach things. We have lots of guests that come on there, syndication lawyers, CPAs. Um, I co-host lots of webinars um, on a weekly basis with great people from all over this nation. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey and your knowledge and providing so much value for my listeners. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Life settlement investments have allowed financial and banking institutions to not only buy their equity contractually, but also diversify their capital from any economic, market, and geopolitical risk. It's been part of the billion-dollar blueprint followed by institutional investors. And if you're an accredited investor, you can also now participate in this vehicle with enormous growth potential. You can watch an informational webinar presented by one of the premier organizations providing life settlement investments for number of solutions at cashflowninja.com forward slash life settlements. Thank you again for joining me on the Cashflow Ninja. If you like what you hear and appreciate what we're trying to build here, please subscribe, rate, and write a review for our show on iTunes and share our show with family, friends, and your network. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can sign up for our newsletter at CashflowNinja.com. I want to thank you for spending your most precious resource with me today, your time. Until next time, my friend, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, situation situation and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.